Well, good afternoon. My name is Troy Sangrone. I'd like to welcome you here to the Korea Economic Institute. Um, we're very fortunate today. We have an extremely distinguished uh, panel with us, um, and we're talking about a very important issue. How do we develop a negotiation strategy moving forward with North Korea? Uh, we also had fortuitous timing. I will be honest, uh, we did not know the summit would be ending when it did and that this would take place, but it's uh, well-timed for us. Um, but I want to uh, sort of move into things relatively quickly um, because we have a lot, I think, to discuss today, a lot of important issues. Uh, but first, everyone has our speaker's bios, but I'd like to briefly introduce everyone. Um, to my immediate right, we have Ambassador uh, Chun Young Woo, who is currently the chairman and founder of the Korea Peninsula Future Forum. It's a think tank in Seoul with a particular focus on strategies for positive change in North Korea and, an event, and the eventual unification of the Korean Peninsula. And I'm sure as many of you all know, previously he served as a national security advisor to then President Lee Myung-bak um, and also served as uh, South Korea's lead negotiator in the Six Party Talks. Um, next to Ambassador Chun is Laura Rosenberger, who is the director for the Alliance of Secur for Securing Democracy and a senior fellow at the German Marshall Fund of the United States. Before joining GMF, she was a foreign policy advisor for Hillary Clinton for America, where she coordinated the development of the campaign's national security policies, messaging and strategy. Prior to that, uh, Laura served at, in a range of positions at the State Department and the White House's National Security Council, including as the NSC Director for China and Korea. And I have to say we're extremely happy to have Ambassador Kathleen Stevens as the new president here at the Korea Economic Institute. As you all know, Ambassador Stevens had a distinguished career in the Department of State and served as our ambassador to the Republic of Korea. Um, so with that, I'd like to turn to the summit and maybe we'll just start with Ambassador Chun and work down. If you could give me some of your initial thoughts on how the third inter-Korean summit went. Well, I don't think uh, it has done uh, more good than harm to the national security of Korea, to the alliance and to U.S. negotiating leverage as a whole. Um, the message that it sends is that the ROK, Republic of Korea, attaches greater, greater importance to inter-Korean relations than to denuclearization. And that's one uh, disturbing message that it could send out. Um, and um, if you look at the specifics, some specifics, I think what uh, you may, you have paid attention to would be what they agreed on denuclearization. You know, they agreed on uh, dismantlement. Well, it mentions about dismantlement of the Yongbyon nuclear facilities. Um, well, that should be part of the denuclearization, of course. Uh, and I don't see much in addition to what was already declared in Singapore or earlier in Panmunjom, when, when they, the leaders agreed to uh, full denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Dismantlement of the Yongbyon facilities is, uh, is uh, I think, uh, uh, a part of the, the denuclearization. But if you look at the formulation very uh, carefully, it demands some corresponding measures from the U.S. and we do not know what it is. So what North Korea means is that what U.S. has done in the way of suspending U.S. ROK joint military exercises is not enough to start the denuclearization process, to submit a uh, full declaration. Uh, so we have to see what they demand uh, in order to begin uh, dismantlement of nuclear facilities in Yangbyon, uh, and that could be an indication of where they are going to start when they and if they start the nuclearization process. Dismantlement of uh, the uh, Dongchangni missile test site. I think this uh, closure of uh, nuclear test site or missile engine test sites North Korea is playing, playing up the value, but when Kim Jong-un declared on December 12th last year that 
their national nuclear force is completed. What that means is they, don't, they no longer need any more tests. Their tests have been completed. So when, when they need no more tests, they don't need test sites. So, uh, and on the, uh, in, in uh, central, part, central Committee plenum of the party on uh, April 20th, Kim Jong-un, he himself admitted that nuclear test site, for instance, has served out its intended purpose because now that they have uh, completed their national nuclear force, so they, they no longer need nuclear tests. And another thing is that uh, these, these are very easily reversible. I, I don't know how many weeks it, it needs to rebuild even if they have to test again. I don't think it, has, it, take, it will take months or years to rebuild some concrete uh, uh, steel structures to, uh, to, to rebuild the test site or engine test site. That's, that's not uh, a irreversible step, very is, easily reversible. And of course, they don't need to rebuild, but it, even if they decide to do it, it doesn't take a long time. But the most disturbing element of the uh, agreement is in the military agreement. I don't think it's very much noticed in Washington. They expanded, they agreed to expand the no-fly zone. And it, it bends within the no-fly zone uh, the flight of not only fixed-wing uh, airplanes, but UAVs, drones, and even balloons. So these are essential assets to monitor and to, verif to verify what North Korea is up to. When they prepare a surprise attack, when they prepare artillery attacks on, uh, on Seoul, in order to respond in, in time or in order to preempt, we need uh, the best, uh, what the military people call ISR capabilities, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance capabilities. We, ROK has developed a weapon system to destroy 90% of North Korean artillery, a long range artillery within 10 minutes. They are in the process of deploying. And actually, North Korean artillery is not a big threat anymore. They cannot inflict thousands of casualties anymore. Only if we have the right monitoring assets you know, above North Korean artillery caves. They have uh, 350, uh, 340 artillery pieces that can reach Seoul out of about 14,000 Pieces. About 3% of North Korean artilleries can reach metropolitan Seoul. And uh, they are hidden in 60 caves. They can be very easily, they, their coordinates are already known, very easy to destroy. And you know, they have to reload, uh, they have to go back to their caves to reload once they have spent their munitions. So very vulnerable uh, North Korean artillery uh, only if we have the right uh, monitoring, surveillance capabilities. And what the agreement says is that you will not be able to, we, we give up, ROK gives up its capabilities to monitor North Korean military preparations when they plan any surprise attack or when they try to harm Seoul with their artillery. There is no way of, we, we will have to severely limit our capabilities to, uh, to find out what they are up to. That's a big problem for our nation. There are many other uh, controversial elements there, but I think this, uh, this is the most uh, disturbing element in the agreement. So in that regard, I, I'm not very uh, optimistic about, uh, about uh, result of the summit. So, Laura, what's your take? Well, I'm not going to inject much more optimism um, <laughs> than Ambassador Chan just, just introduced. Um, I actually want to pick up on this point um, that Ambassador Chan was just rightly pointing to 
about the military agreements um, and the potential implications. And I do agree with you that actually in the commentary I've seen in the U.S. so far, this has not really been part of it. I just want to read actually um, the line from the from the um, the Pyongyang Declaration itself that introduces this, which says that. That the two sides agreed to expand the cessation of military hostility in regions of confrontation such as the DMZ into the substantial removal of the danger of war across the entire Korean Peninsula. That is a very broad statement that I think has significant implications for the alliance. I think it has potential significant implications, um, certainly in the North Koreans' minds, um, about U.S. military assets, about their potential placement, about their activities, about what they may be able to do in the North Koreans' minds. Now, I saw President Moon's comments about, you know, that that no discussion of removal of troops from the U.S. or from the Korean Peninsula would, would happen until after denuclearization is complete. But I think when we see language like this, it's important to understand that may be what President Moon is saying. What, how do the North Koreans read this? Um, and how did they understand this? And that's certainly a lesson from the past has been um, that kind of ambiguity about words um, of that kind of weight can be can be significantly problematic. Um, for me, that relates with a concern that I have about the the drive toward a declaration of the end of the war, which while I think um, pretty much everybody in this room would surely welcome, um, I worry that it's an opportunity for the North Koreans to basically create leverage to say, okay, so we've ended the war, but now you see these activities that you're conducting over there or that the U.S. is conducting or these troop movements or that exercise, small as it may be, isn't conducive um, to the end of the war that we've agreed to. And so those two things combined are really worrying to me. Um, two other just quick points that I would make on the summit. Um, one is that um, the, the very, very quick momentum we are seeing on economic development um, without seeing any other meaningful progress um, on denuclearization in any real way, I think is problematic, especially when we couple it with the things that we're seeing Xi Jinping discussing with Kim Jong-un, the kinds of um, special economic zones it appears the Chinese are starting to set up um, with, the, uh, with the North Koreans or for, with the intent of, of being for the North Koreans. Um, I think that, that we have to do some, some real discussion between the U.S. and ROK about what's happening there, um, how, you know, what's the appropriate pace, what are the things to be concerned about um, in that space. On denuclearization, Ambassador Chan, I think, hit all of the really important points. The only other thing I would note is that um, there's been some loose interpretation, I'm being generous there, um, loose interpretation that I've seen um, out of the Trump administration of the words um, that we have seen, uh, you know, in the in the in the uh, Pyongyang Declaration. In particular, um, Secretary Pompeo talked about the fact that um, the North Koreans had agreed to IAEA inspections um, or IAEA inspectors being present for the destruction of the site. That is nowhere in this agreement. Um, the way that I read it and the discussion of of relevant experts is essentially akin to what we saw with the experts being invited to the destruction of Pungi or the the you know, going back in time the cooling tower implosion. Um, there. There's absolutely nothing in here along those lines, and I think um, it's incredibly important um, that while the United States might be trying to push the North Koreans in a particular direction on that front, because certainly that is what we would all want to see, um, I think it's very important to understand um, that, that there are there is a gap in interpretation here as well. Um, which leads me to my last point, um, which is a broader one which is the North Koreans have always been masters at trying to split different parties from each other, right? So trying to split the ROK from the US, and frankly, what we have seen is trying to split um, different members of this administration from each other. Um, again, something that we've seen in the past, and it's clear from the statement uh, that the North Koreans released um, at the very beginning on the first day of the summit, um, which talked about conservative forces in the Trump administration that are taking the hardline position that denuclearization needs to come first, um, that the idea of splitting remains very front and center to the North Korean strategy here. So, Ambassador Stevens. Well, first of all, uh, as I would expect from my long friendship and, and work together with both Laura and Ambassador Chun, as they have presented a series of really insightful points and analysis that we really need to take you know, very seriously as we look at these statements that came out just yesterday in a summit just concluding. 
Um, I, I guess I'm going to allow it to fall to me to take a, a slightly more uh, optimistic and maybe hopeful uh, approach to your first question, which is, you know, what do we see coming out of the summit? Uh, broadly speaking, I mean, we're focusing, as we tend to do as the policy people, on the joint statement. Uh, and overall, I would say it was positive in the sense that it moves the process forward. Uh, I think you can certainly take a kind of glass full, glass empty approach, particularly to the commitments on denuclearization. And I guess for the purposes of our conversation today, as we look at this, I'll try to be a little bit more glass full. Why? Um, I thought that, that uh, certainly there was a, a very ambitious set of economic steps that were laid out, but I think it was also important that uh, uh, President Moon Jae-in made clear that uh, many of these steps were only going to happen when the time was ripe, which I certainly and I think most people interpret to be when uh, the sanctions regime of which the ROK is very much a part uh, allows that to happen. Uh, I also think that the fact that there were so many South Korean companies, big global companies that accompanied them to, I think, sort of, you know, show what's possible, tempt with the possibility of, of great economic engagement. I do think that uh, I'm more convinced of Kim Jong-un's intention or uh, ambitions vis-a-vis -vis, uh, economic development than I am convinced of his uh, con conviction and commitment to full denuclearization. But and I think that's, that's something we can work with. But I don't think that these, these major Korean companies are going to go crosswise with a global sanctions regime. And I do think that Moon Jae-in was actually quite careful in not going too far and promising those things. The other things, the humanitarian and health areas, are welcome steps. I hope they happen. There have been promises made before. They require cooperation and greater openness on the part of the DPRK. I hope that happens. Uh, the, the, the points that have been made about the, uh, the military, uh, the non-nuclear you know, security, so confidence building measures, uh, uh, as they're stated in the, the, the statement, the, uh, the tension reductions measures, uh, I agree have not gotten enough attention in the United States. And as both of you have just said, are very significant. And I take quite seriously the kinds of points you've made. That said, I do think if you're going to talk about an end of uh, war statement, you actually have to take some steps that indicate the tensions are reduced. So I think the challenge, and again, the statement came out yesterday, is to really look at this thoroughly, both obviously within the ROK itself, but also in terms of the alliance and the implications for the U.S. forces deployment there, the continued need over a period of time, obviously, to uh, secure the, uh, to protect and, and, and contain and secure the, uh, uh, the security of, uh, of the Republic of Korea, whatever lies ahead. And, and finally, in terms of the statement, I mean, on, on the denuclearization issue, I take the points that you made. There's certainly a lot more that could have been there, that might have been there. Uh, but I, I, I think it's, I do actually welcome the fact that, uh, that the Trump administration has uh, uh, indicated this is enough to start a negotiation. I hope that North Korea responds to that. Uh, I agree with Laura. We probably show our backgrounds in drafting statements like this, and I, in the sense that I, I thought that the... Uh, the statement from, uh, uh, from Mr. Pompeo uh, needlessly as, to use a very old-fashioned expression, kind of over egg the pudding, you know, in terms of, of just needlessly kind of saying things that I think are not entirely clear coming out of any of the public declarations so far. Uh, but that nonetheless, they say there's enough to start a negotiation. I really hope to see that starts. And I think it's very important that it start, and I know we're going to talk to the extent we leave time for it about <laughs> negotiations. Um, uh, in, a, in a way that is sustainable and serious and uh, is, yeah, behind the scenes as well. There's a lot of, lot of hard work to be done you know, <laughs> at, at the very best, even taking a more optimistic view. The other point I, I would just make very briefly is that outside of the joint statement, um, I think what we've seen over the past couple of days in Pyongyang is something that I don't think is, is, is perhaps enough perceived and understood uh, here in Washington, and that is that I, th I think you know, the ground is shifting on the Korean Peninsula. The plates are moving uh, in ways that you have to step back and take a little bit of a historical perspective to see. Uh, I'm not saying this, if you like, in a way of whether this is a plus or a minus. I think there are you know, opportunities and dangers in this. Uh, but North Korea is no longer treating South Korea like the puppet state of the United States. Denuclearization is very much on the agenda between the two Koreas. Kim Jong-un has promised to go to Seoul. This would, be a, this would be a big thing. 
And I think it has obviously very important implications for the United States, for the alliance, uh, for the future of the region. But I think that we, even as we talk and we try to draw lessons from past negotiations, past experiences, there's the, you know, kind of use another metaphor. I guess I'd say I, I feel like the sort of gravity is, is shifting in terms of who's taking the lead on shaping and reshaping the Korean Peninsula, including on the nuclear issue, uh, from this side of the Pacific to the other. And I think we have to be very mindful of that and think about that and certainly think about the, the implications and the management of the U.S. ROK uh, relationship and alliance. So, sort of jumping off something you said, Ambassador Stevens, about you know that we're going to move into these talks. You know, and Secretary Pompeo said he's ready immediately. Um, the, one of the questions I think coming into this process was, or the summit rather, you know, would enough be done to get to a second, you know, U.S. North Korea summit? Um, do you think that, you know, basically, given what's happened so far, that we pretty much are on that road? And then I'd be interested in getting Ambassador Chun and Laura's thoughts on that as well, real quick. I, I don't see a problem with uh, Secretary Pompeo's, you know, statement, which tries to put a positive spin on the development that gives a chance uh, to test North Korea's real intention. And it gives if whatever... Pompeo feels in his heart, you know, I think the right response would be to respond positively so that, you know, even if North Korea doesn't really believe in denuclearization, we, we give, give, give uh, Kim Jong-un a chance to think again and give a chance to, uh, you know, to engage North Korea in, uh, in, a, in a more uh, intense negotiations, uh, serious negotiations. So I, I think, uh, you know, regardless of my, of my uh, pessimism, uh, I think it, uh, for Secretary Pompeo, I think he took the right, uh, right approach uh, in responding to the, to the summit uh, outcome. Uh, about second summit, uh, I don't know, but I think it's very important to hold a well-prepared summit because a hastily ill-prepared uh, Ill -prepared summit sometimes can create more problems than, than, than solve them. And uh, as in Singapore, it takes more time to agree on what was agreed in Singapore than to prepare for a successful summit. That would, that would occur if you agree on the principle of you know, holding a second summit and if there is no sufficient uh, preparation at the working level, then it could end up in another disaster. So I would uh, advise a very careful preparation. And, and whether second summit is necessary or not will have to be uh, decided after assessing the uh, result of the working level negotiations, whether what the summit, the leaders would endorse will be a good basis for moving forward in uh, negotiating a roadmap, verification, that's what lie ahead. And you know, if another summit doesn't produce anything in that direction, then, then uh, I think uh, uh, it will not be uh, too much good. So that's that's that would be uh, my advice. Or and we have we have a, a special representative who is responsible for preparing summit or whatever. So welcome to our conference. Yeah. So it won't surprise you that I second Ambassador Chun's emphasis on the need for a well coordinated, well prepared summit. If there is to be a second summit. Um, and I'm going to essentially just accept the reality of where we are right now, whether or not this is sort of the, the way I would have laid this out um, if I were in a different position. Um, you know, we are where we are. Um, and, um, and we have the leaders that we have. And I think that given that, a second summit is, is likely to happen. Um, but I think that what we do need to see is something very different than what we saw in the run-up to Singapore. Um, 
I worry that that is a challenging endeavor for a couple reasons. One, um, going back to my earlier point on uh, the North Koreans' um, ability and focus on splitting, um, the, the North Koreans um, have read our uh, domestic politics um, and I think the lineup of views uh, within the administration um, pretty well. And I think that um, even if we look back in advance of the Singapore summit, um, folks may recall that um, National Security Advisor Bolton was talking a lot about the Libya model. Um, and the North Koreans um, sent a pretty big blast attempting to essentially pull down um, the summit um, and really making clear that this whole uh, Libya model thing needed to be jettisoned and that, uh, and that John Bolton's views should not be the ones guiding the administration. And in fact, um, what the administration did was essentially, um, without saying it, um, do exactly what the North Koreans wanted um, in terms of pulling back on that rhetoric and sort of who was in control. And I think Kim Jong-un's goal is to really make this about him and President Trump alone. I think that feeds into um, some of the personality traits we see from President Trump, and I think the North Koreans understand that. Um, I think one of the lessons from any successful negotiation, but especially with the North Koreans, is the importance of being in lockstep internally. Um, there's no perfect record um, on this. Many of us lived through uh, the, the Bush years um, when there was um, uh, a lot of division within the administration um, that, that caused problems. Um, and I think, again, it's really, really important um, that um, internally we're on the same page, um, both in terms of what it is that we're actually trying to achieve, um, as well as in our, in our messaging. Um, I think that the coordination also has to um, include our allies and partners in this, right? So USRK coordination is essential. Um, but of course, China and Russia also play a really big role here. We're fighting an uphill battle there because we're apparently in a trade war with China. So that makes it a little more difficult um, to do some of the work we might need to do there. But we've got to try. Um, I think it's incredibly important on that front. Um, and so. I think that, that those kinds of preparations are going to be challenging, um, but I think that ensuring that our negotiators who are actually engaging the North Koreans um, are empowered. Um, that President Trump conveys directly to Kim Jong-un that he needs his team to be taken seriously by the North Korean interlocutors, that a summit is only going to happen if he gets what he needs from his team. And it has to be seen as his empowered team. That is going to be the only way to get to that kind of well-coordinated preparation for a, for a follow-on summit. So. Yeah, oh, but maybe, right. maybe just to add to that, uh, one, I mean, on the issue of internal division, yeah, Laura and I are smiling at each other because we were both involved. Uh, I mean, Ambassador Jun was in Seoul and negotiating, and Laura and I were both mostly in Washington uh, in the 2005, 2006, 2007 period when the internal divisions within the Bush administration were so severe. Uh, that at times they really were crippling. They really had a, a huge, you know, and detrimental impact on our ability to work closely with the ROK, uh, mm -hmm. even though President Bush and President Noh Hyun were working quite closely together, uh, and in our ability to have a, an effective negotiation strategy. It's just really, really crippling. Um, and just to add with respect to summits, I mean, my preferred sort of scenario would be, first of all, I mean, I think it's actually what Secretary Pompeo laid out, and that's since I agree with you, is it, it's... Um, I mean, I don't think he, he mentioned this, I can't remember, but I understand that President Trump and President Moon Jae-in are going to meet. There's a mm -hmm. summit coming up. That's very welcome, going to the points that have been made. And, and then Secretary Pompeo is uh, planning to meet his counterpart, the North Korean uh, uh, foreign minister, and then a call on the North Koreans to, uh, to meet with uh, uh, Mr. Began, uh, uh, the uh, North Korean special representative. Uh, that is what needs to happen, and, you say, and this point of empowerment is very important. I mean, a continual thing I've heard over the years, as we all have from the North Koreans, is especially to the Americans, is you never send anybody, se you know, senior enough. You know, you're not sending someone important enough. Decisions are made at the top. Well, you know, whatever one thinks about the Singapore summit or the timing or or, or the, the the framing of it, that issue was addressed. <laughs> so, so now the issue is empowering negotiators. I mean, from Washington, from, and then having empowered negotiators from North Korea who are able to actually see 
what's what's possible. And uh, you know, as a believer in negotiations, you know, I think sometimes what's not possible. The you know, part of part of the, nego the key of a negotiation is is shaping the context in which things were not that were not possible or feasible at the beginning beginning become you know possible or necessary through a combination of of, of carrots and sticks, incentives and pressures. That's the process that we need to get into. And uh, I think that the statement yesterday uh, did set the stage, and I hope the DPRK responds. So speaking of process, and I want to, you know, we talked about this being about developing negotiating strategies and everything. We're in a much different process than we've been in in the past. You know, this is now top down. Um, you know, in theory, I think one would hope that you would have interlocking summits, meaning, you know, we had the early summits between President Trump and Prime Minister Abe, President Moon, then he met with Kim Jong-un. But we haven't really interlocked everything. So I guess my question, will, you know, Ambassador Stevens would be, one, do we need, you know, a summit meeting with Xi Jinping and President Trump to you know, really talk through their positions on this? And then two, how do we sort of make sure that we keep, you know, and Laura kind of touched on this earlier, China and Russia involved in this process and not working at cross purposes with us? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a challenge is because the focus has been so much, if you like, on bilateral and and mostly summit level uh, engagements. Um, there is a real question of coordinating, and and I I don't have a clear sense of what the Seoul Washington coordination has been like, but I, but it seems like it's been pretty good. I, but on, an on if you get an ongoing negotiation, I don't think that it it's the most. <laughs> fruitful or effective way to have it all purely on kind of bilateral basis with, you know, occasionally sort of checking in with each other. I'm not calling for a return to the six party talks, but I would say, and, and of course, Ambassador John was very deeply involved in it, that it offered certain advantages. Multilateral frameworks uh, give you a good platform. Uh, most of the important work, I think, is done bilaterally, honestly. But some sort of multilateral, you know, framework I think would be helpful. And I don't think, I mean, summits are important, but again, as has already been suggested, I mean, whoever's doing the summits, I mean, the leaders are at a level and should be at a level of, you know, those issues that have to be resolved at the summit level. They cannot be into the, the, the details um, that have to be done when we're talking about a process as complex as the verifiable denuclearization, all the other things go with it uh, of the Korean Peninsula. So look at this then, you know, having, you know, led the South Korean effort on this before, you know, how would you take Ambassador Chan and sort of try to, one, coordinate, but then develop a South Korean strategy that, you know, both met South Korea's needs, but stayed within what you knew the challenges were with both the United States as your ally and China, who is an important partner? Well, in my time, uh, the Six Party Talks between 2006-2008, under President Ron Moo Hyun, um, I, didn't, I was lucky not to have serious problems. We had uh, some internal divisions like in Washington, but uh, President Ro gave a full mandate to the foreign ministry. There were uh, some detractors in the Blue House, in the national security uh, you know, team in the Blue House, who wanted to bind my hands, but uh, uh, when we had a meeting with the president, somehow the president gave me a full mandate, and he overruled, he overruled his own staff's recommendations in support of mine. So I, so I had a, I had a more leverage than other negotiators in the six party talks, and I had, a, uh, I was comfortable. Uh, you know, coordinating with the U.S. and others, uh, but uh, yeah, that that was helpful. But in at that time, the difference from now is that President Ro wanted to see a breakthrough in nucle nuclear negotiations before he he held the summit with North Korea, and that's why. The inter Korean, second inter Korean summit was held towards the end of his term. And President Moon takes lessons from uh, that experience that it was a big mistake because what was agreed in Pyongyang at the time between President Romuyan and Kim Jong il 
couldn't be impl implemented because that summit was held toward the end of his term. And it was reversed when the conservative uh, administration took over. So, so he is now trying to, and he actually held a summit with Kim Jong-un before we had any progress in denuclearization. So before North Korea froze its, uh, froze its nuclear facilities, before declaration, nothing has been actually done except uh, a declaration uh, uh, of commitment to denuclearization. So that's why what goes on uh, you know, between South and North now could impede mm. or undermine the negotiating leverage. And when we, when we promise things that should be part of a uh, reward for denuclearization, then North Korea is to lose incentives to move forward as fast as it should. So North Korea has secured an insurance policy against return of what they consider as U.S. hostile policy or military option. So they feel less pressure to move forward now. So the situation is the approach between President Roe and President Moon is fundamentally different in that regard. Uh, so I think for now, the current ROK uh, nuclear negotiator will, uh, I have great sympathy for him because it's so difficult for him compared to mine uh, to coordinate with the U.S. And uh, now the Blue House, the National Security <coughs> Advisor, the Blue House uh, called shots in major you know, uh, decision uh, process on denuclearization. So sometimes foreign, I don't know, you know, I don't know whether the foreign ministry is properly consulted or even informed uh, when important decisions are made on negotiating strategies. So uh, I cannot compare uh, to uh, uh, my own experience with, I don't know how relevant it would be for the current uh, negotiators. But I, yeah, I had, I had also uh, one advantage of uh, having good personal rapport with my North Korean counterpart. He's still there. Kim Gyeongan is, when I first met him, he said he, was, he has been vice foreign minister for 17 years. That was 12 years. He's, he's there 29 years as vice foreign minister. So, but I, I had very, somehow very good personal rapport and I could uh, uh, smooth the communication between North Korea and other Six party partners, because when Chris Hill talked to Kim Gye Wang, or even Wu Dawe of China talked to Kim Gye Wang, they couldn't understand what, what they were up to. Yeah. Very, very difficult to understand sometimes the, the nuances of the Korean language, you know, between the, to read between lines. But when I, when I meet with Kim Gye Wang for one hour, I, and he never refused to talk to me. We had a, separate bilaterals all the time. And uh, I could find out very easily where, what his instructions are. And many Americans uh, say that Kim gye is a, a professional liar. To me, I could detect when he lies under instructions. So uh, very easy to, to tell for me whether he was lying or he, wa he had to lie under instruction. What he, what he had in his mind, what his real instructions. What could be a compromise? So, in that regard, uh, you know, I, I could uh, uh, provide some useful service to others. I was about to say, maybe we should include you in our negotiating team, so that way you can tell us when. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, Laura, you know, you said we are where we are, and you know, based on your own experience, you know, in prior talks with the North Koreans. You know, what insights have you gleaned on maybe what we should be thinking about in terms of developing a strategy going forward? So we had two sort of notes, one of them building off of, of one of Ambassador Chan's observation about Kim Gae Gwan having been around forever. Chae Sun Yee is a long time, um, well-known figure to many of us. Um, I think one point that's, that for me um, always came through is the North Koreans, because they've had the same team in place for so long, they know us better than we often know ourselves. They know the history of the negotiations down to every minute point, um, and they play that to their advantage. And I think that's particularly, um, frankly, exacerbated, and one of the reasons I'm sometimes hesitant to draw too many 
lessons um, in a way is that we actually don't have a lot of experience negotiating with Kim Jong Un, right? Um, the last U.S. experience essentially was was around the the Leap Day deal um, that had all sorts of you know there, that came at a very challenging time internally um, in Pyongyang. Kim Jong Un was re really you know still taking the reins, and I think that there was um, I think we don't really understand the ways in which Kim Jong-un is a very fundamentally different leader than his father and grandfather. A lot of that has become clear um, in his short tenure, um, but I think that we can't underestimate that. And that may, in this context, actually play to our advantage. Um, but I think, you know, understanding that the North Koreans um, sort of understand us sometimes better than we understand them is really important. Um, the other piece that I would say is, I think, an important lesson that goes back to some of my concerns about the uh, Pyongyang Declaration and some of the ways it's being interpreted is that every negotiator uses creative ambiguity in the negotiating process, um, in the process of writing agreements, um, to to be able to find common ground and and reach agreement. Um, you know, the the three communiques, you know, is one of the best examples of of sort of that kind of creative ambiguity where it's actually worked. Um, you know, but I think um, there's a lot of of lessons from the past where um, negotiators have used that kind of ambiguity in search of agreement when it has then come back um, very clearly. Um, to bite us, to put a, a fine point on it. Um, and so I think that we have to think very carefully about where and when um, to, to go for a more ambiguous kind of framing and where to be really, really clearly precise in what we're, what we're doing. The, the third point I would say, um, and maybe we can come back to this, but you know, I think that um, we need to have, in, in terms of developing our negotiating strategy, and I'm sure these conversations are happening internally, um, we really need to understand, in fact, what do we think is realistically achievable, right? Like we may be setting out externally um, what we think is, is the ideal, um, but I think internally we need to have a real um, sense of what is realistically achievable. Um, I personally um, have seen no signs that Kim Jong-un um, has any intention to denuclearize. Um, and so much as I think that we should be continuing to strive for that, I think that um, we need to internally understand um, where, the, where we're likely to go and then have a management strategy for the implications um, that follow if we aren't able to get there. And, and maybe we can come back to that. Well, actually, I'd like to pick up with that really briefly. Um, so when we think of what's achievable, I mean, we often talk about what do we think the North Koreans are really willing to do or able to do. But there's a converse side to that, which I think sometimes we don't get into, which is what is politically achievable here? And specifically, I mean, because there's been discussion, and we may not go down this road, but of having a treaty. And if we have a treaty, you know, that basically means what can 67 senators agree to? And so how internally do we sort of balance what we think the North Koreans uh, might be willing to do with what the Senate might actually accept? And those may not necessarily match up at all. Yeah, I think it's a really it's a really important point. Um, and since you raise it, I would just note that I've seen speculation um, that uh, that there have been efforts to try to look at whether a treaty could be concluded in a way that wouldn't require Senate ratification. And I would just underscore um, that that is a very very problematic political road to go down. And so I certainly hope that any reports of such consideration um, are are not true. You think it should go through the Senate? Absolutely. If it's a treaty, yeah. yeah. I mean, as a former Senate staffer, I would, uh, you know. <laughs> well, when's the last time the, the, I mean, the Senate passed a treaty? Or... Actually, I was looking at this, and I've been thinking of trying to uh, roll this out. There's actually a lot of treaties the Senate passed. So they tend to be on, like, minor little things That's right, yeah. and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of major treaties, you know, it's probably been a while, maybe like the late 90s since we did a real significant international treaty. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, you know, this is the whole question. You know, if you look at the Iran deal, it wasn't, a treaty because the Obama administration, and they were right, I don't think could have got it through the Senate. Uh, but then that left it more politically vulnerable afterwards. So, you know, at some point we will have a new administration, we'll have, you know, a new Congress and everything, all of that nature. And so if we want a lasting change with North Korea, a treaty makes sense. I think there's also reasons it shouldn't be a peace treaty, but that's another story. Um, but also that then means how do you balance the political needs of U.S. domestic politics in the Senate with what the North Koreans can do? 
So, well, and, the, yeah. and there's a the related question, I mean, a related issue to your question of what is yeah. achievable, what is acceptable in the U.S. And you mentioned the Iran agreement, but but yeah. certainly, I mean, any agreement on denuclearization will be measured by many against the the, the standard of the Iran agreement. Yeah. Uh, in a very different circumstance with a country which had a far less developed program, obviously, but was an agreement that has been found wanting and unacceptable by the current administration. So that will certainly be something that will be in any discussion in the United States about what the outcome of a negotiation is here. And looking at that comparison, I guess one question, and you know, feel free to chime in if any of you have thoughts on this, is when we think about the Iran deal, you know, they had to give up fissile material to basically get the money in return. In North Korea's case, we're talking of, you know, maybe lifting sanctions without actually getting fissile material. Like, you know, is this a trade-off that, you know, we can do? <laughs> yeah. Well, no. well, I would be against lowering uh, our uh, negotiating goal. Uh, nothing short of uh, whatever you call it, full, de full denuclearization or CBID, yeah. you know, uh, Denuclearization is denuclearization. There are no partial denuclearization. And uh, I would give uh, benefit of doubt to Kim Jong-un's commitment to denuclearization. And if you believe that North Korea will never denuclearize, denuclearize under any circumstances, there is no role for diplomacy. You do not believe in peaceful denuclearization. And if you bet, yeah, those skeptics have a better chance to win. But uh, still, even if there is 1% chance uh, of success, we have to, we have to try. And um, uh, well, North Korea will try to hold on to their nuclear capabilities for as long as possible, and they will not give up if they can. Uh, if they can do, if they can survive without abandoning their nuclear arsenal, why not? But we have to also keep in mind that Kim Jong Un is playing for long game. Yeah. He, he, he thinks he will be there for 40 years, 50 years. So uh, he's not, if, if he's going to survive, stay in power for five years, 10 years, he has to stick to nuclear arsenal, whatever the cost. You know, he has to persevere sanctions or mm. you know, brave military action, whatever. But if he's going to be around for 40 years, 50 years, and maintain his legitimacy to rule, nuclear armament is not enough. That doesn't guarantee his prosperity. So I think we have an opportunity here. How to make the best use of opportunity, that's, that's very important. And uh, yeah, I think we, have, we can also uh, you know, think about Kim Jong-un's game of just uh, front-loading what he, what he wants. Uh, what he values most, peace treaty, you know, declaration of peace, sanctions relief, all those. Of course, he, if we front load what he wants most, then we will have a problem. We will reduce leverage and we will, we will uh, uh, re reduce chance of success. That's true. But uh, as long as we deny what Kim Jong-un wants to survive, I think there is chance. There's chance that, and another element, another factor that is conducive <laughs> to denuclearization is that, is the declaration, or what Kim Jong-un declared as completion of national nuclear force. What that means, technically, is that now he has mastered nuclear technology and means of delivery. And even if he gives up his entire nuclear arsenal, honestly declares everything and gives up, mm. he can rebuild it within one year, right? And if he can cheat, for instance, and cheat in declaration of the fissile material holdings, if he declares that he spent uh, 200 kilograms of plutonium or HU uh, for testing, even even if he actually spent 100 kilograms. He can hide 100 kilograms of physical material, right? And it's very difficult to verify. So he, 
if he believes that he can cheat without being detected, then denuclearization means one or two months retreat from nuclear arsenal. He can rebuild, even if he shut down the test site, everything, only if he can hold enough, a significant amount of fissile material through false declaration. Then, what it means is he can rebuild nuclear arsenal within a matter of <clears throat> months, one or two months. So, denuclearization after completion of nuclear, nuclear uh, force means that he is choosing a latency of one or two months or at most one year. So this is not the same denuclearization we were talking about. You know, 13 years ago in, in Beijing, in Six Party Talk, that, at that time, North Korea didn't know whether it would take 10 years or 20 years to master the technology, uh, not only warheads, but uh, means of delivery to send those warheads to US homeland. So now they know. Now they know that they can rebuild very easily. And in, you know, with this latency and all the benefits that US has promised, peace treaty, new relations, sanctions relief, everything together, I think that, that would be a, a, a good deal. I think the completion of nuclear force has changed North Korea's strategic, or could have changed North Korea's strategic calculus. He will play this. He will, he will play game to concede as little as possible, to hold on to nuclear arsenal for as long as possible, and to cash in what he demand from the US side, ROK side, as early as possible. Yes, that's, that's the kind of game he will play. But I wouldn't rule out completely the possibility that he could you know, go for denuclearization that it's not not just North Korea's unilateral denuclearization, denuclearization, mutual denuclearization with the US, denuclearization of the US on the Korean Peninsula, plus North Korea's denuclearization. That's, that's what North Korea defines as denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, you know, the, the end of US nuclear umbrella to the ROK, you know, uh, a promise uh, to forego future deployment of tactical nuclear weapons on the Korean Peninsula or in the vicinity of the Korean Peninsula. That, that's all included in the concept of uh, denuclearization that North Korea is talking about. So, so it's not the same kind of denuclearization that we were talking about five years ago or ten years ago. And I think that still, I think, uh, uh, two, three months or one year retreat from nuclear threshold. This is worthwhile. We have to think about the price that North Korea demands and whether it's, uh, it's uh, justifiable, whether we are better off with uh, uh, one year denuclearization, you know, in return for, for instance, withdrawal of US troops, you know, and all those things that North Korea is demanding. So this is something we have to think about. But, but uh, I think uh, we shouldn't rule out uh, the possibility of Kim Jong-un in Ukraine. And he's, I think he's a, he's a genius, a strategist. He knows he, what he's doing, what he's talking about. So, you know, listening, you know, to talking about, you know, that he could withhold some things or maybe try to go for like, you know, a year latency or something. You know, it sounds to me like two things come to mind. One, we need a risk management strategy. How do we manage the risks of getting partially down this road and maybe getting what we think we're getting, but knowing we're not really getting what we think we're getting. And then two, does that entail mean um, we in essence need sort of multiple strategies depending on whether, as you say, maybe he really is willing to go this far and maybe he's not. So I mean, what do you think about that, Laura? Yeah, I think the risk management piece of this is one of the, the most important um, elements. And again, I, I come at this from that bit of skepticism about where we're actually going to be able to get to, um, even if we aspire to, to try. Um, two big points for me on this. One is, and this kind of goes back to your question earlier about, you know, at what point is sanctions relief appropriate? We've started because of we, you know, the maximum pressure campaign and all that, we've started to think about sanctions as synonymous with economic pressure. 
And the reality is that um, the majority, the core, and I believe still the majority of the sanctions on North Korea are non-proliferation sanctions. They are sanctions meant to um, prevent the um, entry into North Korea of, of um, parts and other things that would um, enhance their ability to um, develop their program. Now, at this point, there's a lot that they produce indigenously, and they are less dependent on that than they used to be, but there's still elements of that. Um, but the other piece of it is the outbound proliferation risk. Um, and we know from North Korea's history that it not only has had um, a, a potential willingness to, but has actually um, proliferated. Um, and uh, certainly on the ballistic missile front, um, but of course there was the reactor that the North Koreans were building in Syria. And so I think that ensuring that we, when, when a sanctions relief package is being considered, um, I think it's incredibly important um, to think about how we ensure that the proliferation sanctions remain completely and fully in place and completely and fully enforced even if we're beginning to roll back some of the economic measures um, in a sort of step-by-step -step, um, kind of corresponding um, element. And, and as we see China, Russia, others, um, you know, including apparently South Korea, even if inadvertently, um, uh, you know, allowing some sanctioned goods to get through, um, you know, and we see some of that pressure being ratcheted back, I think from the United States position, maintaining focus on those proliferation sanctions and the importance of them is really important for risk management, number one. Number two, there's a whole set of capabilities that North Korea has and continues to pursue outside of the nuclear space that we spend a lot less time talking about. Um, but as the North Koreans um, are increasingly confident um, in the credibility of their deterrence, I think it's very likely that we will see, if North Korea decides to do so, um, an increased use of various asymmetric tools. Um, cyber in particular is one where the North Koreans, um, frankly, surprised many observers with the Sony hack um, who didn't quite know that their capabilities were to that point or that they were as sophisticated as they were in their use of them. Um, we've, of course, seen North Korean cyber attacks on um, the financial system in South Korea, um, Malaysia, elsewhere. Um, their ability to use um, what are somewhat deniable tools um, uh, and and you know the sanctions that we just saw last week um, on Chinese and Russian tech firms for working with North Korea show that the North Koreans are are quite sophisticated in how they're going about building up these technologies. Um, I think even as the um, as the strategy moves forward on on trying to achieve denuclearization, it's incredibly important to have in place a, a robust strategy to manage these other capabilities um, that I think we could increasingly see the North Koreans um, using. So I want to, in a few minutes, uh, move to the audience. But before I do so, Ambassador Stevens, there's one idea that's been sort of floated out there that I want to get your thought on and everything, which is that the way you know we move forward is we have a declaration for declaration exchange, which is that you know the United States makes a political declaration, presumably with South Korea, North Korea, and China, that the Korean War is over, and that in return, um, North Korea provides us with a declaration of their nuclear program, their facilities, and how much materials they have and weapons. Um, what are your thoughts about something? Do you think it's feasible, or do you think that there are reasons we should be concerned about that type of proposal? Well, I mean, I think it goes back to one of the points, and those points that Laura made about, you know, we are where we are, and there seem to have been some discussions, understandings, we don't know what they are, including at, at the top level about uh, declarations of peace. Uh, we have to think about the alliance management aspect of it as well, and how this plays in Seoul. Uh, but I, I think it's something to, to keep an open mind about, honestly, uh, and to be explored if we can get into this negotiation. There's now going to be a U.S. Uh, a DPRK negotiation. Um, my worry about a declaration would be, and this goes to some of the points that Ambassador Chun said, is, is it, almost by definition it, it wouldn't be a complete declaration, and we might immediately find a kind of roadblock because we would we would know that it wasn't a complete one or we would certainly have our suspicions. So 
I, you know, I have an open mind about uh, maybe, maybe I'm a little bit, again, a little bit more positive than maybe some of the comments about, about being able to say something about peace, confidence building. We've said things before. They've somehow never been enough. You know, the magic words of we have no hostile, hostile intent. We don't intend to attack. We, you know, I mean, both Washington and Seoul have said a lot of things. Is there something else we can say? Sure. And, and I think we should be ready to say it. Um, should the North Koreans be more open about about what they have and what they're ready to do and then do some of it? Absolutely. But that's what I'd like to see actually in the negotiations rather than at this kind of very, um, you know, joint statement level where there's a lot of imprecision and a lot of maybe intentional or unintentional, you know, misunderstanding. And again, I, I, I you know, Laura uh, talked about the leap day agreement, but I mean, many instances of where this this ambiguity, which serves a purpose, it sometimes comes back to bite us. So some ambiguity, but also an openness to uh, uh, to to what we say. I, I just wanted to uh, kind of related to this and to to the nonproliferation points that Laura rightly made is, you know, I would like to see maybe not as an absolute condition. I'd like to see the DPRK uh, commit to return to the MPT. They did that in 2005. Absolutely. It's a very, very different situation now, but that would make it more meaningful. At least as an as an intent uh, to uh, uh, to see where we could where we could go from there. Real quick before we go to the audience floor, um, you know, you talked about cyber, and it doesn't necessarily have to be the only sort of component. But and you also mentioned earlier, you know, this issue of how ambiguity often tends to bite us. I'm curious your thoughts. The Singapore statement is very ambiguous, but one where it's ambiguous is building a new relationship. Is this an ambiguity that maybe we could actually use to our benefit going forward rather than it be an ambiguity that maybe, you know, disadvantages us? I, in theory, I think it could. Um, I think it would define, it would require us defining for ourselves what a new relationship means. I'm not clear on that. Um, but I, I think um, one of the things to bear in mind on this is you know, there's been discussion of a of a new you know relationship between the DPRK and the U.S. A discussion of you know a new era of relations between the North and the South, um, but um, but a lot of the problematic behavior we see from the North Koreans um, is not in those sorts of bilateral terms, um, and I think it would be important that any kind of new relationship be defined as, um, you know, to include, you know, if it were to work in the way you're suggesting, to include things like not using a chemical weapon to assassinate people on foreign soil in an airport where you put thousands in danger, for instance, right? Um, you know, it's not clear to me, um, you know, we'd have to make sure that, that things aren't just defined in bilateral terms, I guess is, is my point on yeah. that. Yes. Uh, well, um, listen. I agree that uh, sometimes uh, constru constructive ambiguity, you know, is helpful or is uh, is uh, inevitable, you know, to reach an agreement. You cannot, uh, you know, formulate each and every sentence to mean exactly the same, obvious for everybody. So sometimes when you have to spend too much time over minor formulation, yeah, you. Sometimes we just gloss over with some ambiguous language. That's that's what diplomats are, you know, used to do. Uh, on Singapore state uh, joint statement, I think uh, uh, ambiguity is less of problem than than the order of the mm -hmm. items. <laughs> and North Korea has different uh, interpretation of the uh, joint statement because they believe that the order of the statement or elements reflects their logic. So it, 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 it looks like uh, as if North Korea dictated the, the joint statement and you know maybe a MIA might have been added to that. Because North Korea has been arguing consistently that you know, if you do that, do this and that, the new relations, in a word, Abandonment of U.S. hostile policy. So new relations uh, means you know, not only diplomatic relations, but you know sanctions relief, uh, you know, abandonment hostile policy, uh, and peace treaty. All those things. When these are done, they are in place, and we don't. If we don't have the 
if when a time comes that we don't have to worry about U.S. hostile policy, when we no longer need nuclear weapons to defend ourselves, then we will deal with that's the that's the order of the logic that North Korea has been using all the time. And Panmunjom Declaration and Singapore de Declaration uh, were drafted in, a, in accordance with North Korea's consistent logic. So they believe that what you agree about new relations, peace treaty, security guarantees, where are they? And why are you talking about denuclearization alone? Denuclearization should be a result of all these things. Well, I think they believe in uh, action for action principle and phased implementation principle, but at least they should be done at the same time. That's what they have been uh, arguing all along. So it's more, more important than the uh, ambiguity of, uh, 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 of the, uh, the language. On this uh, declaration for declaration idea, well, if it is a full declaration, well, including fissile material holdings and uh, declaration of the uh, clandestine enrichment facilities, all, if all those things are included, this is very important uh, initial step that deserves proper reward. Yes, but partial, de partial declaration that we already know, declaration that we can guess. I don't think that's worth that much. And I think the, the first mistake uh, US uh, President Trump has made was to give away joint military exercises for nothing. Well, North Korea would, is claiming that what they did in terms of shutting down their uh, nuclear test site and missile test sites, they try to, to uh, play up uh, uh, that part of their actions. But as, Kim, as I said earlier, this is actually useless for North Korea. They served out their purposes. They don't need them anymore. And that's what Kim Jong-un himself admitted in the uh, uh, Center Party, uh, uh, Center Committee plenum. So uh, I don't think, uh, that deserve suspension of joint military exercises. Joint military exercises, they, this is very big card. I think it's worth at least freeze, freeze and declaration together. But now that they have pocketed uh, these joint military exercises by selling <clears throat> what they don't need anymore, so US, U.S. officials for long have been claiming that, that they will not buy the same horse twice, but they ended up buying a dead horse now, right? Twice. <laughs> yeah. Dead horse, yeah. <laughs> buying the uh, live horse twice is not bad, but uh, buying a dead horse, this is, uh, this is worse. <laughs> so now they are, you know, I think U.S. has squandered one of the most important negotiating assets in return for a dead horse, right? And that gives hope for North Korea to demand more. So they, they, they demand a bonus. You know, joint military exercise is not enough. We need a bonus. If you give us bonus, then we think about declaration. But if it is a partial declaration, then, then we are being fooled again. So, uh, so we have to be very careful. And the, dec uh, the declaration to end the war for North Korea means an insurance policy against return of military option. Well, U.S. unilaterally uh, declared that kind of thing, but joint military exercise is one commitment that also uh, uh, implicitly includes, you know, a military option, right? So. So these are already unilaterally done, but they want to nail down in a bilateral or multilateral agreement that there will be no more use of force against North Korea, even if they, they procrastinate, they do not move forward mm -hmm. enough 
in denuclearization. They, they want an insurance policy to protect themselves, even if there's no progress. I think that's why they need, uh, they, are, they are, you know, calling for it's, it's not just, uh, you know, one paragraph that says the, the Korean War is hereby declared, you know, terminated. That's not what they want. They want, I think, uh, they also want a termination of, uh, uh, indefinite termination of joint military exercises, no use of force against North Korea, all those things. So it's, they would deem it as an interim peace treaty that will be politically effective until legal peace treaty comes into force, something that would fill that gap. So this is not something that, that, that we can keep away for a partial declaration. Okay. I'd like to turn to the audience. Uh, we have about 15 minutes left, so if you could please keep your questions short, and we'll start with uh, Chris. Good. We've got the microphone coming Good. right Yeah. Right here. Okay. Okay. Front. Ah, there we go. Thanks so much. Uh, Chris Nelson, Nelson Report. Really great discussion and couldn't be more timely if we tried. Uh, Ambassador Chen, thank you for the best sound bite so far. We bought a dead horse. <laughs> uh, so everybody <laughs> circling that one, underlining it, because uh, we, you know, we're certainly worried about it. Uh, a two-parter. Uh, Ambassador Stevens, uh, you made a really good point about, gee, how about uh, uh, the NPT? But I think it's more important, really, than you wanted to stress it, because uh, uh, that would get the, I think, the IAEA back in it, mm. which would be a really critical part of any kind of inspections that we're doing. Mm -hmm. So one of my questions is, um, is it a good idea to have them destroy Yongbyon? We kind of need to have the IAEA guys going through Yongbyon like Mueller's uh, forensic accounts, you know? Uh, uh, so that's the first question. Mm -hmm. But Ambassador Chan, you said something that really surprised me, but maybe I, I have missed something. You said that for, uh, for Kim, denuclearization is about the peninsula and about U.S. forces and weapons and things in the peninsula. Is it really that clear? I think most of us, when we talked about this, have said we need to know if, if by denuclearization he's talking about the end of the U.S.-Japan nuclear alliance, you know, the U.S.-Japan nuclear umbrella, the whole U.S. force structure in, in North Asia, Technically, you know, Kim's demanding that we denuclearize, right? Uh, so, but, but you seem, the way you said it was uh, he's only looking at USFK and, you, and maybe the U.S. nuclear umbrella over South Korea. Did I misunderstand that or, it, or is it clear that they're not actually looking at getting U.S. nukes out of North Asia, which obviously impacts the Japan alliance? Okay. So, thank you. So we can get as many questions as possible. We can try and keep our answer short, too. Um, well, this. Oh no, no! I'm trying to get both yeah. sides to keep it. You know. <laughs> well, very briefly, yeah. I mean, on the NPT, I said I would like to see uh, the DPRK uh, express its re readiness to return to the NPT. That that is a commitment to denuclearization. And I, uh, what's in the statement about uh, Yongbyon is is, and of course, this is in the context of the U.S. taking corresponding measures. Um, is the permanent dismantlement of the nuclear facilities in Yongbyon. So I, you know, I think that would give, you know, as in the negotiations to follow, room to, to, to uh, agree that there are inspectors there and that the permanent dismantlement uh, take place in a, in, a, in a inspected and observed and complete way. So that language is okay with me. Uh, and I think it gives us room to do what we need to do. Okay. Well, um, North Korea's position on the denuclearization of Korean Peninsula is very clearly defined in North Korean government statement dated, uh, I think, uh, July 6, 2016. Yeah, they, they say what's different from CVID and uh, CVID from uh, in the of Korean Peninsula, they say, you know, but I think they don't mention that, but implicitly that includes North Korean denuclearization. But in addition to North Korea's denuclearization, that uh, as uh, no nuclear development of the ROK, ROK should give up its nuclear program. They believe that, you know, or for the future, they, they want to include that one. They also, uh, mentioned the foregoing of U.S. 
nuclear deployment of U.S. nuclear weapons and uh, uh, strategic assets that can uh, that capable of nuclear weapons. So that does on, on the Korean and, and the, yeah the end of extended nuclear deterrence, of course. So these are they don't mention about Japan. They only mention on the on uh, and Korean Peninsula and the surroundings. Uh, they don't mention. But surrounding how far? I don't know. Maybe 12 nautical miles. I don't know. Doctor. Further than that. <laughs> but they, they haven't so far mentioned Japan in their official statement. But um, they mentioned withdrawal of U.S. troops. But you have to pay attention to the reason why they mention withdrawal of U.S. troops. Because they say because U.S. troops in the ROK are part of the command and uh, control chain of command of in using nuclear weapons, and that's not true. So, uh, on the basis of reasoning that North Korea uh, gave, you know, we can, you know, I, I don't think uh, withdrawal of U.S. troops is included in the context of denuclearization. But that's part of the peace treaty. Peace treaty means withdrawal of U.S. troops. And in my conversations with my North Korean counterpart, he asked me whether peace treaty means withdrawal of U.S. troops. I said, no, they will, they will stay in Pyongyang and watch baseball. And they will stay there as a, a, a strategic stabilizer of the region. And what he said was that, uh, then we don't need, uh, 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 this is just a piece of paper that can be torn at, at any time. It's not worth more than a piece of paper. But in different conversations, I know that between US and North Korea, you know, North Korean said that they can, they can uh, live with uh, US troops in South Korea. But I don't know in, one, in what context they said. They may, might have thought that it's useless to talk about withdrawal of U.S. troops at that time. So instead of, you know, arguing, arguing what they couldn't achieve, they might have, uh, you know, decided to show as if they are flexible, making a big concession of tolerating U.S. presence. But now I don't know. They have different negotiating leverage now, and I don't know if they they can uh, live with. Uh, uh, U.S. troops, uh, when they decide to denuclearize, I doubt it. Okay, so I'm going to bundle some questions because we're really short on time. So we'll start with Mark Mannion here. Mark Mannion from the Congressional Research Service. Uh, thanks to you all for a great, uh, great presentation. Two quick questions. Uh, the first on the um, joint statement between the two militaries uh, that was agreed to separately from the leader's statement. Um, as I read it, I mean, it seems like all the concessions were coming from the South Korean side. Ambassador Chun, you referenced some of them. Is there anything that you see that the North Koreans gave up that uh, is useful there? And then secondly, um, you know, it's clear that for the two Koreas to move forward on some of the economic cooperation projects and other projects uh, that they have, they're going to need agreement uh, from at least the United States, if not the permanent five, uh, to waive certain sanctions. So which, given what we have gotten so far right now, the current status, uh, what would you say would be OK to approve uh, in terms of North-South cooperation? For example, over the summer, um, the US blocked uh, the transfer of some rail equipment, uh, railroads, uh, to North Korea. You know, is that the kind of thing that we should now allow, or should we continue to hold the line on that until we get more? Okay, and then Mike right here. Raphael right up front. Uh, Mike was sending PBS Online News Hour. Beyond all the statements and everything, I was struck in the Wall Street Journal story, I think it was, <laughs> in the uh, ceremonial part. They had these crowds out chanting reunification, reunification. Uh, now, it may seem far-fetched, but in September 1989, nobody was talking German reunification either. What is the, uh, to 
Is this a bread and circuses thing by Kim, or is this stating a longer term, a fairly serious uh, ob object on his part? Because in South Korea, you don't hear much about reunification these days. Okay, and then there was a lady back here who had a question. Uh, did you still have a question? Oh, okay. Um, all right, then we'll take the lady in the back. Any questions? I can Unfortunately, very little time. Hey, uh, Diane Perlman, School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution at George Mason. Uh, in addition to what you mentioned, Ambassador Stevens, on Max changing the sh shaping it with um, carrots and sticks, incentives and disincentives, um, what about also other strategies, um, like what's the underlying conflict about, and also addressing some variation of like a truth and reconciliation commission, or you know maybe some public ritual recognizing you know the trauma from you know the severe devastation that's um, to shift the energy in the process that has been successful, and variations on that are emerging in various conflicts. Okay. Maybe what we'll do now is uh, maybe start with you, Ambassador Chung, and then move down, sort of answer the ones that you feel are relevant for you. Well, on uh, Ms. Mannion's question, uh, on the military agreement, I couldn't find anything, uh, you know, useful from North Korea's promises. And I think the, the, the fatal flaw of the agreement is that there is no verification. Even if you can trust North Korea, there should be verification. So, you know, the, the mantra that verify, uh, trust but verify. On this case, even if trust unconditionally, if, you, if North Korea is not trustworthy, and don't verify, that's the spirit of the, the military agreement. So, whatever North Korea agrees to that, that bans any means to verify whether North Korea is complying with its own agreement or not. So if there is no way to verify compliance, I wouldn't attach much value to, to that agreement. On economic projects, I'm not very much worried because whatever, whatever they agreed will have to be consistent with, uh, with the Security Council sanctions. And also, I think U.S. unilateral sanctions. If we are, if ROK is going to maintain a, a smooth uh, policy coordination with the U.S., I don't know how it can be done without, uh, while openly, uh, you know, violating, uh, going against U.S. sanctions. But it may go against the spirit of sanctions. But I think all these are the premises that uh, will be there when North Korea, uh, you know, can uh, move forward, when North Korea makes progress in denuclearization and the sanctions are eased or lifted. So that's how I would understand. Otherwise, uh, I, I don't think the ROK government, President Moon, is willing to uh, defy international rules, Security Council resolutions, in order to uh, move forward in inter-Korean relations. Um, on reunification uh, uh, slogan, yeah I, yeah, I think North Korea is, and Kim Jong-un is giving, you know, uh, effusive lip service to the, to the virtues of unification, unification. And that's, unification is a kind of a raison d'etat of North Korea, to exist as a separate entity. But I, I don't believe that he attaches greater value to unification than his own survival. And unification by force means the end of his regime, end of his survival. I don't think he's, he's ready to take that risk. So well, he, will, he, will, uh, he will keep praying on the altar of unification. But I don't think he will... Uh, use force at the risk of his regime survival to achieve unification. That's not what I what I would believe. Laura, 
Um, so I would just sort of pick out two quick points. One, on the question of Mark's question on sanctions relief and um, you know, what would be appropriate um, in order to facilitate some of the economic incentives that have been agreed to um, or sort of discussed in principle. I mean, I think my skepticism probably came out earlier. Um, you know, I'm, I certainly don't think that we should be lifting um, any sanctions um, until we've seen some meaningful progress on at least some metric from the North Koreans. I mean, even if, you know, there's the denuclearization metric. There's the the other, you know, the other piece of this you talked about on the broader military. There's a whole other host of commitments that North Koreans could make in tangible terms about use of capabilities or giving up some of those capabilities. Um, you know, absent those, um, I, I just think it's it's very ill advised. Um, and again, I would just put down another marker on the need to differentiate anything that has proliferation implications um, from anything that's sort of in the economic space. Um, on the unification points, I share Ambassador Chun's skepticism. The other thing I would just note is that um, unification, um, a, an agreement to unification, so if it were sort of by um, a consensual process and not some kind of force, would, among other things, require both North and South Korea to revise their constitutions. Um, that is no small lift in particular, um, I would think, in, in the South. Um, certainly Ambassador Stevens and Ambassador Chun have a better handle on public opinion and the internal dynamics on that. But both North and South Korea in their constitutions define the entire peninsula as the ROK or the DPRK. Um, so just an example of one of the major sort of practical things that would have to be um, uh, addressed um, in addition to a whole host of other um, impediments to, to getting getting there. And the last word? Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> well, yeah, there's that too. Yeah. <laughs> and we haven't really talked about China. China, yeah. 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 Next time. Uh, uh, other impediments. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, next time. Um, I'll just make my final comments on, on these questions, uh, kind of in the context of uh, the way that, uh, a question that, that Laura raised earlier. I mean, having to ask ourselves what is achievable uh, as we think about what we hope to have. But also, kind of, what is essential? And I think one thing that's essential for the United States, uh, and I think for South Korea, is to manage and keep in good shape uh, the U.S. ROK relationship. It's kind of obvious, but I would just underscore that. Uh, and, I, and I think Moon Jae-in's comments, uh, including today or yesterday, uh, uh, made that pretty clear that he's. And I, I, I take him at his word there. Um, so within that. That context, um, I would say on the question of what kinds of things might go ahead after the Pyongyang summit that would not run too uh, awry of, of the sanctions regime and U.S. Uh, desire to keep the pressure on on denuclearization, and also to the question of how do you build a process of reconciliation that may eventually lead to reunification, but how do you actually build a peace process? You know, the kind of thing we talk about in other places, whether it's in the Balkans or Northern Ireland or the Middle East. Um, I, I personally would, would you know, not mind, if you like, or even welcome seeing uh, earlier movement uh, on the, the areas like family reunification, mm -hmm. the health issues, the humanitarian issues, and attached to that, in this shifting atmosphere on the Korean Peninsula, uh, some work in this kind of peace and reconciliation area. Uh, it may make people feel a little uncomfortable or even a very, very cynical, and there's always a lot of room for cynicism, but I think that that's a process that, that even notwithstanding the fact we have grave doubts about how far we can get on denuclearization, that that's a process that given where we are, that maybe we can, we can try to see it go forward a bit and see where it takes us. Well. Thank you. Uh, this has been a really great discussion. We're going to have to have a discussion a lot more, but please join me in thanking all of them. Thank you.